In this segment, we'll hear from Dr. Ann Nebeljan about her experience speaking on a panel about the portrayal of people with disabilities in television and film. Let's take a listen. I guess, can you just start from the beginning? Yeah, How did the you panel. get invited? What was the panel Well, about? it was interesting because um, I had consulted for the first time to um, a show, um, Private Practice, about they were having an episode about a child with spina bifida. And so um, my name has been on the USC experts um, directory as an expert in spina bifida. And after 25 years, I was finally called to use my expertise. So so they, I guess they liked what I, how I consulted with the writers and they invited me to be on this panel too. And, and they looked at my bio and they said it was, the, the Writers Guild of America has a um, committee on, for writers who have disabilities. And they were having, gonna have a first ever panel on, this t- on the topic of disability. And so, um, so then I got a call, would I be the keynote speaker? <laughs> and I really, you know, I had never talked to this gr- a group of writers before. And so I said, well, what do you want me to talk about? And they said, well, they, they, the writers like to hear stories. They like to hear evocative stories. You know, stories that make them think, so maybe that would be in something worth writing about or writing into a story. And um, so so I was so honored to do it and to be on the panel with um, the director and writer of the sessions, um, a writer from Parenthood, um, the woman, I, I can't remember these names, but the woman who wrote... Um, uh, Warm Springs about FDR, um, David Radcliffe, who's who's a writer, who has CP, who speaks, is who you you heard him speak, and then one of the Push Girls who, um, from the uh, the show on um, Showtime about girls who are women in a wheelchair who are dancers. And so, you know, so I chose some of my research, my qualitative research, looking at we, Mary Lawler and I studied adults who have spina bifida and, um, and their everyday life experiences. And we found that this topic of shoes, you know, what it's like to wear orthopedic shoes, growing up having to wear orthopedic shoes and how disabling and oppressive that can be to, especially when you're young. And so that was kind of an unexpected finding. So I shared some of those stories. And then then they, the next, um, for other speakers, they showed part of their film um, and then they just talked. So, um, so it was very exciting. It was, I hadn't done anything like that before. And so it sounds like it was just to sort of maybe get people comfortable specifically writers who are putting who are basically putting on tv what a lot of people is their only exposure to somebody that has a disability right and so there's so much control in these writers rooms Mm -hmm. in terms of how a nation perceives or how a nation reacts to somebody with a disability right so I mean, that just goes back to the whole... Mm-hmm. Where we started. Yeah. Yeah, because, you know, and, and things are changing, and it's, um, you know, I think you just have to watch some of these shows. Well, my favorite, which wasn't there, but is Big Bang Theory, because, you know, it's about these smart guys, and, you know, one at least has Asperger's. You know, they have all their oddities, but... Um, you know, it's it's a comedy and it makes you laugh. My son, who has Asperger's, he watches it and he laughs out loud. <laughs> you know, and um, so I think that that's really educational. Um, so what if somebody has the spot at the on the couch that they like to sit in? And you know, I mean, you res- respect that. You know, that's part of who that person is. And, so what if they like to have Chinese food on Wednesday every Wednesday? Right. Well, mm-hmm. and then I think what it what 
what's really happening is that a lot of these shows, and going back to, I, I keep on quoting this panel. I think uh-huh. now I'm going to actually have to go knock down on, on David Radcliffe's I door. I think I would love you to. <laughs> um, and, and talk to him specifically. But, um, you know, it's not, the person is not just their disability. You're a person. You right. have, like, your interests and mm-hmm. and hobbies and mm-hmm. goals just like everybody mm-hmm. else. And and that you want to get to the point where you don't have to say that, where right. you don't have to say it just like everybody else. Right. You're just a person. Mm-hmm. And that's why we need to be out there in the world with everybody, just being Living. ourselves. <laughs> right. Yeah. Being a person. Yes. First. Yes. And then maybe learning more about or teaching somebody about your disability. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Is okay, there anything else that you wanted to... Yeah, this has been fun. Good evening, everyone. And thank you for being here with us tonight. We're so excited about this panel. And Hollywood Health and Society is delighted to co-host this panel with the Writers with Disabilities Committee and the Diversity Department of the Writers Guild of America West. We're here tonight, and I'm going to name some from some very special people in just a moment. But we're here tonight to celebrate and encourage accurate portrayals of people with disabilities in television and film. The most powerful portrayals allow us to see the human spirit triumph over the obstacles life throws at us. When truth is reflected in these storylines, we see characters become more compassionate, more understanding, and more human. And now, I'd like to start by introducing our keynote speaker, Dr. Anne Neville Jan. Dr. Neville Jan is an associate professor of occupational therapy at the University of Southern California. She specializes in mental health practice in occupational therapy, occupational science theory, and disability studies. Prior to joining USC, she served as director of occupational therapy at the Boston VA Medical Center. Dr. Neville Jan is an expert in spina bifida, both as a consumer of services and as a research scientist. In fact, she recently worked with us at Hollywood Health and Society and private practice on a storyline about spina bifida. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Neville Jan. Thank you. So I'd just like to start with saying thank you, STA Writers with Disabilities Committee and Hollywood Health and Society for inviting me here. The theme of tonight's panel is Real Disabilities, Real Stories. And I'm honored to be here among so many writers and actors who are brought to film stories about disability. Tonight I'll share with you several real stories from my research conducted with a colleague at USC. We set out to study the everyday life experiences of adults who have spina bifida. Unique to my story is that I'm both a researcher and a research participant with spina bifida. This double identity puts me in a position to get the real story because I know what it's like to be in our study participant's shoes. And you'll see the significance of shoes as I go on. I note about our research, it's qualitative meaning that we were not interested in numbers and statistics, but the narratives that are typically hidden in the numbers. We interviewed people about their experiences growing up with spina bifida, and we hunted for the details within these narratives. An unanticipated theme arose in our interviews with women who had spina bifida about how shoes mattered substantially in their everyday lives. Several women provided us with compelling narratives about a topic thus far unexplored in the medical and social science literature, the impact on one's identity of wearing orthopedic shoes. As in other aspects of our data, stories about shoes were sometimes accompanied by some form of it's a little thing, a phrase that often marked expressions of the experience that mattered. Sometimes these little things can have huge ramifications for a person's identity and can exclude them from participation. 
Let me now tell you about Camille, one of our research participants, and her struggle for independence. We interviewed Camille at her home, a single family house in a middle class neighborhood. She was married, has had two teenage children, and worked as a professional in a medical field. She brought up the topic of shoes as a problem she faced growing up. Her concerns began during adolescence. She spoke angrily as she recalled the following. I hated Easter. I hated it because everybody got dressed up and I couldn't wear any dressy shoes and I hated it. I despised it. I think she really disliked it. <laughs> I, de I despised it and I would try and wear them and they would hurt and I couldn't walk. Going to Mass and walking up to Communion, I was always feeling very self-conscious, and that's when I started to get depressed. It was that transition from eighth grade to high school. Camille struggled with foot infections due to a lack of sensation. She described being on crutches several times during high school. Using crutches actually made her feel normal. She commented, because my bad foot was bandaged, I only, had to, I only had to wear one shoe. I could wear whatever I wanted, and I didn't feel self-conscious. Other students would ask me, ask me if I had a skiing accident. I would lie and say yes. That was more cool than saying I had spina bifida and going into a detailed explanation. Camille grew up in a small town, and after she had bladder surgery, for the first time in her life, she was able to leave home and go to college. Prior to this, she had worn diapers and was too afraid to go far from home, lest someone find out about her incontinence. Her foot infection healed, and for two years of college, she was free from infections. She told us that she wore all kinds of shoes. However, one evening, upon checking her foot, she saw that it was extremely bruised. She surmised that, unbeknownst to her, someone must have accidentally stepped on her foot. After a few days, the bruising turned into an open wound that wouldn't heal. This was Camille's first experience of managing medical issues on her own. Her orthopedic surgeon recommended that she be fitted with space shoes. She recalled, I went to pick them up and I was shocked. They were horrible. The outer part showed every detail of my deformed foot. I was really pissed off and depressed. My psychiatrist wanted me to bring them to therapy, thinking that if we talked about them, maybe I'd wear them. I left his office and threw them away in the nearest trash can. She said to us, that was 30 years ago and I can still picture that trash can in New York City on 87th Street on Park Avenue. By the way, Camille told us that those shoes cost her over $300. Because she refused to wear space shoes, she was labeled as non-compliant. She described that she became more and more depressed as her wound would not heal. She said, I felt guilty placing so much importance on appearance. It wasn't supposed to matter, but it did. Her parents wanted her to return home so they could take care of her. She thought this would be a sign of failure and refused. She told us that she continued to wear her own shoes. Her therapist felt that he had no choice but to admit her to a psychiatric unit. Camille stated, I agreed to go to the hospital. I didn't know what else to do. I wouldn't go, go back home. The first day in the hospital, I woke up and defiantly put on my shoes. When the staff realized that I was walking around in the shoes that were not recommended, they took them away from me, locked them in the nurse's station, and put me on suicide watch. They thought I was being self-destructive by wearing my shoes. I just wanted someone to understand. In her struggle for independence, she demonstrated extreme resistance to having her identity be stigmatized by wearing orthopedic shoes. A number of our other participants so, told similar and compelling stories. However, the following participants' narrative presents a striking contrast to the experiences of Camille and the other women in the study. Barbara, a young woman in her early 20s with spina bifida, had foot impairments, 
but selecting fashionable, fashionable shoes had not been a problem for her. In fact, she told us that she particularly liked wearing boots with high heels. Unlike the other women in our study, Barbara's scoliosis resulted in extremely short stature. We conducted our second interview with her at a restaurant over dinner. As we were walking from the parking lot to the entrance of the restaurant, we commented on her boots. Barbara wore light brown leather boots with at least two inch heels and pointy toes. They were very stylish. While her boots made her taller, she still stood only about four feet tall. When we entered the restaurant, the maitre d' standing behind his podium asked, how many? Mary, my co-researcher, replied, three for dinner. He had a questioning look on his face, and then he came out from behind his podium where he noticed Barbara. He said, oh, I'm sorry, but we don't have our children's menu available yet. Almost immediately, he realized that Barbara was not a child and proceeded to see this. It was a very uncomfortable moment. Later in the evening, Barbara commented on this incident and how people frequently stare and make comments about her short stature. She said, now that I work, it happens every day. And you know, sometimes like the people who work with me, they just kind of laugh about it. And not laugh like at me, but just kind of, you know, say to the customers, okay, thanks for coming by and kind of kick them out and make them order their food faster. Or they just say, that person will help you over there. And they're really good at it. Stigma management occurs in public life when an individual with a visible impairment encounters strangers. Barbara's coworkers participated with her to manage the public's reaction to her short stature, and they were very good at it. Barbara was able to make choices regarding her shoes but her stylish boots were not sufficient to allow her to pass or appear normal. normal. The stories our research participants told us about managing appearance in everyday life highlighted how the personal practice of dressing, for example, wearing fashionable shoes, was important for their, social, for their personal and social identity. By sharing these stories tonight, I hope that they can have a real effect on attitudes about disability. Thank you. So now we're going to hear from David Radcliffe. David, yeah. there's no clip, <laughs> just your photo. Yeah, no it's clip. I'm, I'm going to sing. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> your money's on its way. <laughs> uh, I was in a um, skiing accident on a mountain called Cerebral Palsy. <laughs> I don't recommend it. It's a, it's a, it's a rough ride. Um, but I was always, uh, I was always, um, I watched a lot of television and a lot of films as a kid, and I went to film school, and and I continually wrote all the time. And and part of what attracted me to writing was that I was under the the I realize now naive impression that if you're a good writer, then you're only evaluated by what's on the page. I didn't think about salesmanship in a room. I didn't think about initial impressions uh, when I walked through a door at least not in, in respect to the profession that I wanted. So I thought, well, this is a job that, that people are encouraging me towards because they're saying that my work is good, and you're welcome to read it. I would love for you to read it. Uh, <laughs> but it was also a, a conduit for self-expression and for figuring myself out and for trying to find my place um, in the world, um, as I think it is, is true for any writer. I think that... I'm, I'm still struck to this day by how incremental the changes have been in terms of how disability is represented. I think that you, I think there's a sort of tacit assumption that you can say things about a disability group that you can't say about other minority groups. It's uncomfortable to say it about other minority groups. For example, <laughs> people with disabilities just want to live independently. And if we said that about anybody else, it'd be really <laughs> awkward. Um, I was watching one of those entertainment magazines, I think it was Extra or one of those shows, um, and one of the hosts, and, and you know, th these things are scripted, so somebody wrote this down, gave it to him, and he read it, and he felt comfortable with it, and he said, you know, I think Glee is doing such a fantastic job of humanizing people with disabilities. <laughs> and I thought, well, shit. <laughs> 
what was I before he saw Glee? <laughs> I love and, you. And what, <laughs> I love you. And what was interesting is that, and we should, we should feel free to talk about these things. The, the host of this show was a black male. And if anybody said, you know, I think that show, The Cosby Show, did a fantastic job of humanizing black people <laughs> off the television. Um, and so I think, I think there's a balance to be struck between being really aware of the stories you tell and the words that you use, but I also don't want to be one of those militant people that's like, I'm a person with a disability, I'm not disabled. Well, you know, once we go down that rabbit hole, then nobody is happy and everybody feels uncomfortable. And I think the, the purpose of media, if it's used appropriately and, and intelligently, is to make people comfortable without them even really knowing, knowing that they are getting more comfortable. The, 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 the function of the Cosby show, the reason, besides the, the wonderful writing and the performances, that, that show wasn't special because the family was black. It was special because that was a family who happened to be black. They didn't talk about their blackness, at least not, I missed, missed that episode if it happened. <laughs> But I feel like with disability, even today, even on shows that are celebrated for their depictions of disability, the disability is at the forefront of that character's purpose. So if I'm in a scene on my crutches, I'm not an actor, so please don't put me in anything. Um, if I'm on a scene in my crutches, like I can't just be going to get a cup of coffee at Starbucks because we don't do that. We don't go to movies, we don't go on dates, we don't get coffee. We have to have a, a backstory that says, my life was traumatic, and I really need this coffee. <laughs> uh, and sometimes you do feel that way. Uh, but, you know, that, that's not... I, th I, think we're, I think we're several stages behind other representation, and, and I think that some of that has to do with who's in the writer's rooms. And, and the reason that these events are so important to me, and not just to me, but to anyone who knows anyone with a disability, is that, you know, everybody's got their... Their minds attuned to this. And as I've said to many people, I am part of the only minority, <laughs> minority group that you can join at any time. <laughs> <laughs> nobody nobody uh, falls out of a window and becomes gay. <laughs> or, you know? uh, so, so if we get comfortable with it now before we get old and cranky, and wonder why our hearing's going, and how do we communicate with our friends, and God, this club is so noisy, and I can't walk up these stairs. Why do we wait 60 years before we start thinking about this stuff? Because I'm already well, well ahead of you guys. I'm just waiting for everybody to catch up, so <laughs> thanks. Thank you. I really like what both David Radcliffe and Dr. Neville Jim had to say there about disability, because I, I, I think they made a good point, and for me, one of the big takeaways is that disability isn't something just limited to this small group of people. It's something that we all deal with. We all have challenges that, that we deal with in life and they don't have to be this bad thing. They can be something that uh, shapes who we are and, and really gives life an interesting flavor. The dilemma of difference really is that while there are challenges associated with disability, there's also some really interesting life experiences that, that you have because of it. And so it's kind of this balancing beam of, of the positive and the negative. And really, I think in, when, it, when it comes down to it, it's, it's just another way of living. And there's no one right way to live, and everyone kind of finds their own path in life.